So what else can we learn about an atom? The negative charge of those electrons and the positive charge of the protons is what kind of keeps the atom together. So opposites attract. So the negative electrons are pulled towards the nucleus. At the same time, similar charges repel each other. So those electrons are constantly moving because they don't want to get too close to one another. Um, the number of protons in an atom is going to be our atomic number. Okay, Protons are forever. So this is our atomic number. And protons are forever. I want you to repeat that little mantra. Protons are forever. If you're ever talking about an atom, you want to talk about its number of protons. The number of protons doesn't change. If the number of protons changes, the atom, the element itself changes. So a carbon atom always has six protons. Always, 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 always. Oxygen, atomic number eight, always has eight protons. If it has seven, it's not oxygen, it's nitrogen. So we need to pay attention to those numbers of protons. Protons are forever. So the atomic mass then, the weight of the atom, is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Protons plus neutrons. Because both of those have a mass of one AMU. Remember that those electrons are negligible. And we can denote this mass a couple of different ways. You need to be familiar with both of these. You may see it listed as carbon-12, where the 12 is the atomic mass. Or you may see the 12 in the upper left-hand corner next to the atomic symbol. If you see that, you should also note that the atomic uh, mass is 12. But if protons are forever, what's the deal with carbon-14? Here it is. Protons don't change. So if now in carbon-14, what's my mass? Mass is protons plus neutrons, and protons are forever. A mass of 14 equals 6 protons plus how many neutrons? 8. Neutrons are not forever and neutrons can change and we call this an isotope. An isotope has the same number of protons but it has different numbers of neutrons. So what property is going to look different? The atomic mass. If you see the atomic mass being different, that's a tip-off for you that we're talking about an isotope and we have a different number of neutrons. Again, to calculate it, we just want to take the atomic mass the atomic mass minus the number of protons is going to give you the number of neutrons. So carbon-14 has eight neutrons instead of six and it's denoted as the atomic symbol carbon, letter C, with the 14 in the upper left hand corner. Unlike carbon-12, carbon-14 is unstable. It's what we call radioactive, a radioactive isotope. And it means that it's giving off energy. So the nucleus isn't stable, and over time it's giving off electrons. I'm sorry, giving off neutrons. And carbon-14 isn't the only radioactive one that we can talk about. Right? There's also carbon-13. There's also carbon-13. Here you can see in this table the differences, right? What's forever? That's right, protons are forever, six, six, six. No matter which type of carbon we're talking about, we're always talking about six protons, okay? In an isotope, the electrons are the same. Now, how do we know number of electrons? Well, in a neutral atom, that's one without a charge, then the number of protons has to equal the number of electrons. So if protons are forever, and we're talking about a neutral atom, six protons is balanced by six electrons. Six positive charges balanced by six negative charges to give a total charge of zero. In an isotope, it's the neutrons that are changing. Now, we can use isotopes for a variety of different things. Your body cannot detect between the isotope and the more common form of an atom. So your body can't make those differences. Living systems can't make those differences. And that gives us a benefit because we can harness these for, say, medical imaging technology. Um, here's a picture of an Alzheimer's brain. 
versus a non-Alzheimer's brain as detected through radioactive imaging using radioactive isotopes. So it gives us an idea and an ability to compare the way different living systems are interacting. Now, isotopes do have some drawbacks, right? Exposure to extreme radiation can lead to cancers and damage DNA and lead to different mutations. So it's important that we limit our exposure to radioactive um, isotopes and radioactivity in general. Now, if we're talking about chemical bonding and talking about what's really going on, we really need to focus on the electrons. It's the electrons that are involved in chemical activity. And these electrons exist in energy levels called electron shells. And the electron shell that we're most interested in for bonding purposes is the one in the outermost electron shell. So if you check out the periodic table, there's an interactive periodic table listed here, um, which I find really useful. We can see all of our different elements here. And you can choose different properties that you want to focus on. So the periodic table allows us to predict kind of the behavior of electrons. For our intents and purposes, we're going to talk about the first two to three energy levels that electrons can be found in. In the first energy level of any of our atoms, we can hold two electrons. So in the first energy level, we can hold two electrons. And that atom is full and satisfied with those two electrons. That's all that can fit there so close to the nucleus. In the second and third energy levels, we need eight electrons in order to be satisfied. And if we don't have eight, we get a little bit feisty. We want eight. Eight makes for a stable atom. Eight, we want that octet rule. We're always trying to get eight. And atoms are willing to do whatever they need to do to get eight. They may steal electrons from another atom. They might share electrons from another atom. Or they might give their own electrons away. Whichever way is going to be the path to least resistance, they're going to do to get that stable number. So stealing and sharing happens and we form ionic bonds, and that tends to happen between unequally matched partners. Covalent bonds, or sharing of electrons, tends to happen between partners who are pretty equally matched in terms of their strength. And by strength, I mean the number of electrons in their outermost energy level and their electronegativities, which we'll talk about in just a moment.